I said, yo, we'll turn our backs. <laughs> Anna. Good morning, everybody. I hope you had a good evening yesterday. I'd like to get the day started, but before we move on to the, uh, the enjoyable aspects of the day, just to, to say uh, tomorrow there may be a fire alarm in this building, uh, but I don't think we have to... Sorry, it's a test of the alarm. We don't have to evacuate the building or anything, but it might be a bit loud tomorrow morning. Anyway, moving on. So, it's uh, my very great pleasure to uh, welcome our second keynote speaker, Dr. Francisca Schroeder from um, Sonic Arts Research Centre at Queen's University in Belfast. Uh, she's a senior lecturer there and is going to explain everything else because <laughs> she said, already uh, let me off the hook. So, thank you very much you, and I'll let you carry on. Great. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I figured that uh, probably not many of you know me. I know some, some of you, and we've met through some sort of network and performances. But I, I thought I'll give you just uh, the beautiful building I work in, Sonic Arts Research Center. These are my areas of research at the moment. And like in most cases, these things change. Some years it's more this, and some years it's more that. Um, if you don't know the Sonic Arts Research Center, it's a fantastic building. It's a, an acoustically a va variable space. It's a 3D space. Um, and uh, so you can change the, the walls and the floors and all this kind of stuff. And we have lots of beautiful loudspeakers, so you can see some performance space there. So I urge you, please come and visit. It's a fantastic space to be composing in, to be doing tests. And we do sort of tests for 3D cinema sound and so on. Um, I thought the best probably is I start you off, it's a, quite an old study, it's called the APART study, but it's kind of gone through ICMC, so some of you may have read about this. Um, we were at the time, and this was kind of at the time when we started working closely with Karma, doing a lot of jack trip connections, we were testing a lot of stuff. 
And the reason why I'm showing you this is, first of all, because I think it's quite funny. It's a lot of latency, and I seem to be the one that's always lagging behind. Of course, depending on where you are, um, you always think you're lagging behind and everyone else isn't in time. But then, so these are three different studios. It's just a, um, a kind of a triptych video, but we are in three different spaces. Um, at the time, it was several days, we were testing everything from graphic scores, 3D graphic scores, um, kind of avatar representations of how to see, how to interact with other people. We're testing different kinds of latencies, and I'll, I'll just play you a little, a little bit of this because um, this is what I do sometimes. Yeah, useless, useless saxophone player, you might say. Now, the interesting bit is, of course, when you get into the free improv. Sorry, this bit before. Um, just the point, I guess, I, I, I don't really, really want to talk in detail about this study, but I'm really happy to talk to you about this. But um, a lot of the sort of um, learning we were doing throughout this, the Ornette Coleman piece, is obviously a really uh, well synchronized piece. And we kind of slowly moved away from very synchronized pieces of music towards more graphic score based, free improvisation kinds of work. Um, but the reason why I'm also showing you is that um, I want to start with a kind of a 10 minute theoretic re reflection on listening and on being kind of in network performances and on this idea of distributed listening. And for this, um, all my thinking is really informed by practice. I'm a practitioner and um, so this, it's really important for me. So the permission I was given when I was invited to do this keynote talk was about um, so that I had the permission not to do the techie talk. You don't need to talk about the technological stuff because you guys are all doing this very well, but you can talk about more about this of creative practice. Now, as my argument today, I want to take slight issue with this because I don't really separate technologies and creative practice, and I, I don't see them as opposing ends, uh, on opposing ends. Particularly for me, technology is not sort of bits and bobs or blobs and you know, network stuff that we sort of plug in. So for me, this real connection between creative practice and, um, and technology is going to be very important. And I'm particularly taking some of the clues from the etymological um, origins of the word technology. Um, and techno, we might think of, you know, this might actually suggest more than uh, technological things. It might suggest skill. It might suggest expertise. It might suggest something like understanding intelligence, possibly, and potentially also evolution. So this is kind of in the back of my mind when I think about this. Um, but I also take quite great inspiration from uh, philosopher Alva Noy. Um, he wrote this quite exciting book called Strange Tools. Maybe some of you know it, Art and Human Nature. Um, and he poignantly argues there that technologies also organize people. So he says technologies also organize us. He said they're not just you know, bits and bobs, as I said, but this intimate connection and especially listening is an active engagement with the world. Um, he, he calls this activity organized activity, and I will come back to this a bit. Um, so our modes of perception, and of course I'm talking listening because as a musician what we do mostly is listening, but also other modes of perception, seeing, it's always this active engagement with the world, the self-making of the world. And he says, um, we're always caught up with the act of acting, of being in the world, of maintaining and bringing the world in focus. So listening very much for me is this kind of maintaining, bringing the world into focus, but also the self-making of the world. So this is very much at the back of my thinking. Um, but we might think of, for example, this idea of um, distributed listening and organized activity in terms of tools. So I like to think of this tool as a hammer, um, especially if you know uh, the writings of Heidegger. He liked to use the, uh, the, the tool as a hammer to argue um, his ideas of Dasein, of being in the world. And Heidegger, as well as Neu, they argued about this engagement with the tools, that it's not just something we simply use, um, but that they are both arguing that these are patterns of organization, and this is something that um, Neu also talks in this book. So technologies organize us, the tools organize us, 
and their evolving patterns of organization, he says. Um, more so, he says, we think with these tools and through them, and this is an argument Heidegger also made, the way we bring the world into being, and he's giving this uh, um, argument of the hammer. It's not just something we use, but we think, and we think with and through these tools. So if you take anything away from this, to, uh, from this talk, it's probably this sort of last point that I, I want to re-emphasize and that uh, features very strongly in my thinking when I talk about distributed practice. Um, what I'm also quite interested about when I think about technological developments or technologies um, that uh, they're not just here, as I said, to be things that solve problems, that they also frame new problems for us. Um, and again, if I go back to Noy, um, he says that technologies teach us new things. They frame new problems. They allow us to do things we couldn't do without them. So, for example, we might think of the the technology of the plane. Without the plane, we wouldn't be flying, pretty obvious. Um, but also we might think, think about, you know, I give you a very simple example, a uh, Word document, I might be, it might allow me to write or type a poem, but it's not just that, of course, when I learn through the, you know, using the interface, um, it teaches me how to, how to type, which fingers to use, and which uh, maybe uh, formats to export it, and how to share it across the world, and so on. So it's a simple example, but um, I think it's an important thing that we might want to think about when we think about these technologies. So they allow us to think thoughts and understand ideas that we couldn't think or understand without them. And this has been sort of quite influential in my thinking. Um, what, what I'm thinking is specifically, and to go a little bit back to, um, to my specific title and to the idea of network performance, that network technologies, I, I think very much what they also do to us. And the examples I'm going to give you, um, I have about four or five sort of some historical examples that I think fit quite nicely under this umbrella of distributed practice in a very wide sense. Um, but when I think about what, what these technologies teach us, especially in, in, in um, network performances, I think about being disconnected. And I think we all know about technologies that fail us. We haven't seen it too much in this com uh, conference, but um, especially you know, in, in network performances, so we talk a lot about this a lot, about <laughs> things not working. But being distributed, of course, um, and Chris, where are you, Chris? Chris and I have been, you know, thousands and thousands of miles away, playing together in different rooms, different acoustics and so on. So all these things, uh, um, what that means, for example, about being disembodied, and that's really important for musicians, of course. It seems an obvious statement to make, but um, actually Chris and I will probably have this amazing experience on Wednesday that we will be in the same room, which we haven't been before. But Musicians, we, you know, we gaze at each other, we breathe together, we give each other clues and cues of how the music starts and stops, as simple as that sounds. But, um, of course, the sort of technological challenge around being distributed, it's all this notion of disembodiment. How do we deal with these kinds of things? Again, notions of authorship, and I think that's something we've come across a lot about, you know, who, who's starting the piece, who's finishing, and whose piece is it, and who's in charge, and who's making decisions. And often you find that there's these sort of different nodes of decision making. You probably make different decisions, and we don't know about it, and we make our own decisions just to kind of make it work from our point of view, from our listening point of view. Um, but further also, notions of interruption, delay, absence, and I'm talking kind of, I guess, of theoretical and um, philosophical terms as well as technological terms. Space, and I'm going to talk quite a bit about the sort of acoustics, different acoustics of space, and then, of course, notions of distance. So these are all kind of interesting things to think about as a, as a musician or as a creative maker, I think, working in network environments. So... Um, before I go on to some specific examples, um, I think this is an, an kind of an interesting point that Noe makes, that we might think of technologies as inviting and inciting refinement and improvement. And I'm sure most of you think along those lines because you're always tinkering and improving things and making things, well, better, maybe worse sometimes before you make them better. Um, so I want to talk about, or want to think about distributed, uh, distributed listening um, and I have talked about this kind of idea of the sonic flannery, and I, um, this is kind of a thinking that goes back a few years, talking about this real embodied interaction that we have as musicians with our instruments before even thinking about distributed nodes. 
So this idea of listening in really haptic ways, and I've referred to this as haptic orality, and maybe it's a sort of the ordial thing that you were talking about yesterday. Maybe it's sort of trying to find, find a word for this. Um, but in, in a way, in this idea of sonic flannery, and of course it goes back to the, the, the flaneur, this 19th century Parisian boulevardier who strolls or saunters or leisurely goes down the streets while discovering the city around him or her. So the ear for me in these environments. And it is something really difficult, I think, unless you've been in a network environment and you've played music and had this experience, it might not mean very much for you, but maybe for some of you who have been, this, you can kind of understand where I'm coming from. So in a way, in a network, in distributed listening, for me, the ear is always kind of sauntering with less focus necessarily on a specific sound or object because sometimes you can't necessarily identify where it comes from. So it's always an exploratory activity when you are listening in the network. Um, it's a getting to know and a getting lost in and that comes also from the sort of flaneur, this idea of that you just sort of go with a crowd, you let yourself sort of getting, you let yourself be lost in the city, but that doesn't mean to be disoriented. It's a kind of, it's a kind of gentle exploring knowing, and I, I find very much parallels there in listening for me as a musician. Um, and finally, before I move on to some example, this comes from Honoré de Balzac, he <laughs> described the flaneur as the gastronomy of the, of the eye. And if Ben is here, who talked so beautifully yesterday about food, uh, you, you might, uh, you might uh, like this quote, but so uh, I, I, t I like to think of, of, of listening as a gastronomy of the ear. You have all these kind of sounds from different ways and you savor each and every sound and sometimes it's this honing in so you pick up that little beautiful jelly that you, we had yesterday evening in the concert and then at other times you might just sort of look at the plate and in its sort of beautiful all-round kind of ways. So listening becomes very much this kind of sauntering, lounging activity. So I want to think about distribution in terms of how we assign sounds, how we share sounds, how we um, kind of allot them in different ways. Now, I'm not a big fan of categories, I have to tell you that, but I have made an effort to um, kind of put these into different categories because I think it allows me to structure my talk in a more sort of meaningful way. So I want to look at a couple of examples of thinking about distributed practice as listening particularly towards one space, and you might sort of wonder what does that have to do with network performance, but I get to it. Um, I, I will use the example of Lucier sitting in a room, the probably most famous piece that all of us know. I still want to play you a little excerpt of this. Um, I want to look at distributed practices that focus towards several spaces, and I give an example of a recent piece that I uh, collaborated in called Museum City, and a piece that was developed for the network called NetRooms. Um, then I will look at this idea of distributed practice as thinking about objects, about sound objects. Um, and I recently had the pleasure of being in Lisbon at the newly opened Museum for Art and Technology, the MAT, and Joan Onofre is a kind of a sound artist, Portuguese sound artist, really interesting guy who um, I'll talk about his piece in a bit. And then again, sort of a historical piece looking at Max's Neuhaus's work, this idea of distributed practice to think about it as connecting people. Um, and of course, that hardly makes any sense if you can if you follow, because in a way you could argue, well, all these pieces connect people and they all connect, you know, listening in different sort of ways. So that's why I'm saying the categories are here for kind of a structural element, but they're not necessarily trying to exclude one or the other. So bear with me. I'm sitting in a room. Um, I probably don't really need to tell you much about the piece, but <coughs> this is Alvin Lucier using that text recording here the speaking of his own voice, recording it into a particular room, uh, speaking it into a room, recording it, and then re-recording that process, and so on and so on, until you hear the frequent, the resonant frequencies of the room. Actually, you can hear the resonant frequencies of this room beautifully while I'm speaking. Um, so, anyone not know the piece? This is the... Different from the one you are in now. I am recording the sound of my speaking voice. 
and I am going to play it back into the room again and again until the resonant frequencies of the room reinforce themselves. Um, I'll stop you here because I want to play you a little bit of the next cycle. <clears throat> I see in the room different from what you are in now. I am recording the sound of my speaking voice. I am seeing the room different from what you are in now. So you, you, you get the idea if you don't know the piece, but you can hear the frequencies of the room becoming more and more important or more and more covering or making the words unintelligible. Um, so for me, this very much, I think of this as a distributed kind of listening piece. And the reason for this is um, that uh, I am, I, for me, and this is again, it depends on where and how you listen to it, but it is this kind of constant zooming in and out of different sounds in different spaces and the the more the room becomes the sound of the room the more for me it becomes a kind of uh, a way of using this idea of the sort of sonic flannery where you really asked as a musician or as a listener to be very flexible and and kind of zoom in and out of different sounds or nodes although these are not nodes on a kind of network to, or a global network as such um, it becomes this kind of gaze turning inwards and, and again I'm, I borrow from French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy who talks about listening as this reflexive action and I think it's particularly relevant for this piece this idea of listening becoming very much um, you know re reflecting about your own position in the world and reflecting inwards a kind of a gaze turned inwards as he calls it um, so, so this is, you know, in a way kind of an early network piece for me uh, I haven't performed it, has anyone performed the piece? Yeah, so you probably have very different experiences of when you're sitting in the room and when you're recording it. But I think it's an interesting position to be in. It's a, a, probably even a more privileged position to be in when you're a performer performing that piece. So maybe you can all have a go and try it. I think I would urge you to try it. Um, okay, so I come to this next piece. It's a distributed piece for sure, but it's not a network piece in that sense of... Um, uh, of uh, Jack Tripp network piece. Um, the reason why I'm cho choosing this is um, because I think it's a visually stunning piece, um, but also it connected, it was uh, commissioned by a festival in the north of Portugal called Viseu. Um, this was those artists that you see on the screen. Um, we, there was a preparatory stage where we went into five derelict spaces around the city um, and it's kind of capturing the sounds of these spaces through impulse uh, um, recordings of the sites and through improvisatory actions in each of the sites. Um, the piece then was crafted, so we used all these different sites. I'll show you a couple of pictures of the sites in a minute. It was crafted into an overall almost one hour piece at the end in a huge cathedral and um, the projections you see on the sites are kind of elements from the, these derelict sites that we try to transport kind of into a central space. So networked in that sense that it kind of networks, um, it networks acoustics of different spaces around the city, it networks um, memories and narrative stories of people, um, it also kind of shares um, spaces that are usually inaccessible to people in the city. So for me it has all um, this idea of being distributed. We went to an old mansion house, it's now been turned into a five-star hotel, so the acoustics here are very much stone, um, lots of kind of uh, stone stairs that we recorded there, you can see the microphone array there. Um, an old slaughterhouse with still carcasses lying around, very gooey, but lots of, basically no roof, so really open, reverberant spaces there. Um, an abandoned music hall, precarious wooden floors with some sort of latrines in the background. Um, Maybe you can start hearing some of these spaces yourself. So this is, uh, um, you know, the alcove, of course. As a musician, this is an interesting space. You explore the different acoustics of that alcove over there. You can see the chalice of the sort of wooden spaces of the doors behind it and so on. 
And just here to show you the sort of impulse response capturing, which then was convoluted in the end. Um, and it's very much, I, can, I think you can see the relation to Alvin Lucier's piece here is about transporting the different acoustics of sites. Um, and this was probably acoustically the most interesting space. An old wine federation there on the site here, there was these thousand liter storage spaces. So you could sort of play into these big balloons, which was absolutely fantastic. 15 seconds reverberations. Um, so the, the Portuguese title of the work is Cidad Museus, Museum City. Um, I want to play you a little excerpt, just a minute. And of course, it's hard to know which bit to take, but hopefully you kind of get a bit of an idea of the projections and also of the, the kind of the transporting of the different sounds from the... I'll pick somewhere around here. So here you can see the abandoned music hall. the sort of uh, eerie sounds you heard in the background is all the convolution of all the different spaces. So the, the piece was in sections of sort of representing each space. Um, and the, again, as I said, the projections you saw was correlating to the spaces that we're trying to sort of bring into this concert hall for people who don't know the spaces. So for me, this is a kind of a nice example of distributed practice as connecting spaces. And I want to give you a very obvious example of a kind of a network piece because that was written for the network. It started in 2008. It's by the same composer who was in the previous work in the Museum City piece. It's a piece called Netrims. And I know that uh, um, a couple of people here have um, worked with, uh, with Pedro on this be uh, before because it's a participatory piece. It's a bit like actually what Ariana was doing last night. So people are sending in sounds and then the role of the composers to distribute the sounds that are coming from all these different spaces. I'm using it as an example for distributed practice as connecting spaces because, again, it's about the sort of private, social, acoustic space of each of the participants that become then in the performance, become shared, but also become sort of distributed, not in terms of just technologically as in which speaker, which sound goes to, but also compositionally distributed as in when, which sound appears. Um, I play you a little bit of this because it has a nice, I think, a nice graphic interface of um, anticipation of when which sound is coming from, um, from which site. <laughs> 
So the, the piece for a long time existed just as an audio piece and then I think sometimes people have this thing where we need to give the audience something to look at so this visual interface was kind of added on later on. So the piece sometimes still gets played, that's why I've left the bracket off from 2008 to these pieces are good to sort of reuse to bring people together. Um, so I want to use, uh, move on to this idea of connecting objects, distributed practice of connecting objects. And it really only occurred to me when I was in this absolutely fantastic building. Um, so this is part of a decommissioned power station at the Tejo power plant in Lisbon. It was built in 1908 and then decommissioned in 72. So it hasn't worked as a power station for a long time. But it has these four absolutely incredibly gigantic metallic boilers. And they are something like 30 meters high distributed across a huge platform um, and um, Joan's piece, um, you can see this sort of wink untitled towards the kind of, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the conceptual art movement of the 1960s of trying not to sort of title your piece, but then of course if you put in brackets orchestral, there's a whole notion of the sort of compositional aesthetic behind it. Um, and indeed the piece is, um, it works, um, um, so it works in this room, it's exciting, these boilers, there's 16 robotic arms that are driven by solar-powered panels. You can actually, so you get a bit of an idea of the space here. Um, so depending on the weather condition of how much sun there is and so on, um, the piece <coughs> plays a percussion piece by a uh, percussionist called Miguel, uh, Miguel Bernard. Um, and these kind of objects become the instrument. And it's not just about um, playing these, these metallic kind of containers, but it's about making a sort of a musical work by connecting these different objects as a kind of a musical instrument. Um, now, I was speaking to, um, to Joan to ask him for, and he gave me a very good sound example, but one of the girls who was working on the sound as a kind of a sound engineer, Susie Ribeiro, she, and I have to see if this works, she gave me this video. It's a bit of a Blair Witch kind of thing, but I, I think it gives you a good idea of the space a little bit. You get the idea. Now, what she probably should have done is not move. I think in terms of thinking about listening, it's actually quite good to have a stable position and just really listen into the space. The more, while, you, while she moves, of course, you, you get a different sort of narrative structure and a different idea about it. But I think it gives you a good idea about this kind of these gigantic boilers being turned into these percussion instruments. And I, I was thinking really very much about how distributed practice can in this instant very much turn objects into or connect sort of object in these sort of distributed ways. So finally, I guess I'm thinking about the obvious thing about how, how we think about distributed practice is connecting people. And Max Neuhaus, to me, um, he staged uh, this larger body of work called Broadcast Works. Um, and I just picked one particular example of the public supply piece from 1966. Um, and they have a particular place, I think, for me, at least in the hist history of distributed practice, at kind of it really puts on display how people become connected as social networks um, through sound. And they're possibly you know, an early example even before the internet existed. So um, this is a phone-in piece. So at the time, people would phone in into the radio station that Max Neuhaus was, and again, it's a bit like Ariana's piece. You kind of contribute sounds. People were leaving their radios on in the back background for additional feedback. Uh, and it became very much about the sort of social spaces and the social voices of people and connecting them through this broadcasting piece. Um, and 
I guess um, Neuhaus, and I think he's also interesting in terms of thinking as a composer, not thinking about music as something to be listened to. And Dieter, that, that is what he said. He said, you know, we've really forgotten about the meaning of music. It's not about making a piece that, uh, a musical product that piece, people can listen to. But he said it's about creating a dialogue. And a, he calls it a sound dialogue. And in fact, he calls himself a catalyzer of sound activities, which I think is a really nice way of thinking about it back in the 60s, of course. Um, so let me play a little excerpt. It's a bit wild, this one. <laughs> the trumpeter was having a good time. <laughs> um, so my final example, and it's a, it's a piece, or uh, an app, a mobile app called Live Shout that uh, I've been working on over the last two years. Um, I, sent, I left you a list of features there if, if you're interested. Um, this app is also going to be used as part of audio mostly with some of the female laptop orchestra improvisers um, who are playing on Friday night. So I have the pleasure of being back in Belfast, but I'm going to be distributing in through Live Shout um, from Belfast into that gig, which is going to be hopefully fantastic. Um, now, this, this uh, Live Shout app, it uses the local Sonos map, and some of you uh, might work with uh, um, Jérôme Joy in Aix-en-Provence, so we've had a, a long-standing co collaboration with them. They've been running this sound map of open broadcasting microphones in, since 2006. Um, the interface is like this, it's quite simple, but you, you, know, you switch your microphone on, so you turn your mobile phone into an open microphone. Um, if you go into the second kind of arrow, download, you can see on a map, it's very good for kind of distributed practice, creative performances, and I show you an excerpt of a performance we did with a the theater in a minute, because you can see who's online and who's sending and who you potentially could be listening to. It's got an integrated Twitter feature, which is quite nice for, again, for live sort of pieces, for tagging specific events and so on. So this piece, um, we worked with a, a theater practitioner in Belfast. It's a, one of the biggest theater companies there called the Lyric Theater. Um, the woman's called Amanda Coogan. She's often described as the Marina Abramovich of Ireland. She's quite a crazy person. You can see some of these visuals. So this was using Live Shout, again, connecting different spaces of the theater that the public usually wouldn't have access to. So this is a little balcony. It's the boiler room, talking about boilers again. You can see the actors here using the microphones, using Live Shout. They're sending sounds. It was using Shakespeare's once more onto the breach speech as a kind of a, a looped narrative that was holding the piece together. Um, this was be it's behind the stages, again, where public has no access to, performers installed there using live shout, recording, um, sending sounds. Uh, this is the prop store, again, an actor installed into that room using the props and using the Shakespearean speech in a kind of fragmented and looped sort of way. So the piece is called Once More, um, and I'll play you uh, just a little, um, little excerpt. And again, like in most pieces, you have a very different uh, view and an oral kind of picture depending on where you are. And I think what's interesting in this piece, um, the audience was guided around the different places in different groups and different trajectories. Um, and you might be, you can have your phone on, you can have live, live shot on, so you might be hearing something in a way that you haven't seen before, or you might be seeing something that you have heard before, you might be seeing something that you haven't heard before. So there's all this play with anticipation of events of, between kind of the oral and the visual. And there's a central hub. When you come to the central hub, you hear all the streams from all the sites. 
But not everyone has that trajectory because you might start in the central hub and then go off, which gives you a very different idea of the piece than if you start off in the boiler room and you think, what are these sounds over there? So again, it's a, it's a video. It's trying to capture as well as possible the experience. So play a bit from here. So, anything to take from this? Well, I hope I've given you kind of uh, an overview of how I think about distributed practice, and I gave you four examples of thinking about connecting one space, several spaces, connecting objects and connecting people. Um, but I think more importantly um, that I think some of the pieces, specifically pieces such as Alvin Lucier's piece and... Um, and um, the public supply piece by Max Neuhaus, they very much paved the way for the way we think about distribution and how we think about maybe distribution in terms of network environments. Um, more importantly, and I think this is um, something that has been interesting for me, that network music making discloses and illuminates aspects of the way we find ourselves organized. And this is not just as individuals, but as a kind of social, a network of social people as well. Um, that um, also, and again, this is going back to the argument I gave you before at the start, and this comes from Alva Noy, that we think through and with our technologies, for me, a really important point as a creative practitioner. Um, that technologies are not only able to let us ask questions, but they um, allow us to think in different ways about certain things, especially in network music, as I've talked about authorship and distribution, disembodiment, and so on. Um, what I think is probably interesting for a lot of us is that they permit us to solve problems, some problems, and of course, to frame new ones, probably the mo most important one to take away for me. Um, so I think if we subscribe to this idea that technologies an idea that I subscribe to, that they allow us to think thoughts that we maybe haven't been able to think or understand or that we couldn't understand without them, but also that technologies might invite or incite refinement and improvement, then from my point of view, that I think, you know, we all, as creative makers, we're on a probably very provoking, meaningful and quite an exciting journey. So anything, something I'm very excited about. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, that was extraordinary, thank you. It really made me start to think about certain problems I was uh, buzzing away there. So, um, any questions for anyone? I found, personally, I find it hard to frame a question because I've got too many thoughts. But, uh, oh good, would you like to say who you are? Adrian York from the University of Westminster. Um, with the, sorry, firstly, thank you for the talk, it's fantastic, really interesting. Um, with the mu museum city 
piece, was it difficult to kind of hear the convolution reverbs in, in the actual performance space that you were in? To, could they be defined against the, the ambience of the, of the museum space? I think there's probably two answers to that. Yeah. It's not difficult for the musicians because we were in the spaces. We yeah. had recorded and spent days in each space sure. and we knew the acoustic properties of each space. But I think it's an, an excellent question because we asked ourselves this very much from an audience point of view while you sit in that performance. But I don't think it's that important really from an audience point of view to know, oh, that must be that space and that must mm. be that space because it's quite an abstract piece in the end. So even the, the pictures that you can see projected onto the walls, they're not necessarily tell you exactly where you're supposed to be. So it's not like a game piece that, oh, I'm in that space and I'm in that space. It's a more abstract sort of creative uh, response yeah. to the spaces, I think. Sure. And with the one small piece, were the feeds from the different locations coming in through live shout, or were there distributed speakers in the different uh, venues? Yeah, yeah so they're, they're coming through the Locusona sound map and they get collated through Max MSP, and then yeah. we, we had a sort of a surround sound installation, eight speakers where you could, would be in the middle, it was a circular array of speakers, so you could be hearing each of the spaces. So there was a central, a central listening hub, space. A yeah, central yeah. hub, yeah. yeah. Great. Which, in a way, that makes sense. When Once you get to that space, it makes sense. I think a lot of people, we did a lot of interviews afterwards, people were saying, what was all that about? Sure. <laughs> but, you know, it's challenging the audience, and this is about listening, so Live Shout is really a listening app. It's about getting people not to always think about the visual aspects first, but to really engage in this idea of, oh, let your ear do the work for you, and even if you don't know what's going on, by the, by the end of the work, it should make sense from an oral point of view. So it's a challenging the audience, I think, a bit in terms of listening. And was there any synchronization going on between the performers in the different spaces? The, the only synchronization really was the text. Um, so they were feeding off each other in, in a kind of improvisatory fashion, sometimes, you know, reading the same line or moving on into the piece and so on. So not, not really, but I mean, I think as soon as you have a text, it's kind yeah. of already yeah. lays out a certain grid in terms of how people narrate stories with each other. So, so each of the performers could hear the text? Yeah, each, each performer could hear other people yeah. um, cool. perform. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe. It's a food question, I can feel it. <laughs> um, thank you uh, for this really fantastic talk. Lots of ideas that um, I want to follow up on. Um, it made me think of a, of a couple of things that um, I'm not sure if they're going to coalesce into a question, <laughs> but um, I'd love to just hear more about how, like I'm thinking of um, the, w the way that, that music and, in particular, real-time digital systems can serve as sort of models of uh, um, society or maybe just more generally, you know, modes of, of being in the world with other people and um, thinking about also, like, uh, Christian Wolff's comment that the musical is the political um, and how we sort of represent structures in, in sound. Um, a, a lot of your closing comments are things that, I, that I've been thinking a lot about as well. Uh, when you have distributed sound sources in a space that are associated with people, I think it reinforces your awareness of the other people and, and um, provides another kind of window onto a, a community. And um, yeah, that didn't really coalesce into a question, but I, I would just be curious to hear you uh, talk more about that, uh, some, some of those points that you made in your closing comments there about um, the, 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 the connections um, that this type of work can um, provide a unique kind of window on. Yeah, I, I, it, was, it was a really nice statement because, yeah, you, you didn't frame a question, but you, you made a beautifully sort of summary comment. And, and of course, a lot of my thinking comes from Georgina Bourne and Christopher Small's idea of you know, music being social, it's political, it's cultural, and so on. So that, that forms a real strong part in my thinking. Anything I do, it's, it is always about you know, the sort of social connections of people. Um, I, I'm not sure if I can add anything else to maybe what I've said, but um, for example, Live Shout, and that might be an extension to your beautiful reframing of some of the issues. Um, we have used a lot with children 
Um, so we get them to explore um, ideas around listening and giving them small rules like, uh, you know, catch a, I don't know, a particular sound or a staircase or we have um, the first picture you saw was in the Assorge. We send them to explore the sounds of craftsmen and hence the, that picture that you saw when I talked about techni, about the craftsmanship. So all people that are working with old tools, old sho like shoemakers that still have the original machines, printmakers that have the original machines. Um, and again, making that a kind of a participatory, collaborative piece for children as makers, as sonic artists, as composers, as listeners. And it's really fascinating to see, of course, you know, kids being su such digital natives, it's not an issue for them to walk around with that live shot, but how they capture and how they kind of extract stories from people, I think that's the sort of interesting aspect of, again, what the sort of technologies reflect back on us. And uh, I'm, I'm really interested in some of the pedagogical aspects of kind of getting kids on board very early on. Actually, I'd be super fascinated. Um, I have seen something about food and sound within a sort of a children's festival um, and kids kind of exploring bugs and eating things like that with specific sounds. So maybe that would be something interesting. I'm not sure if, the, if that answered, but then again, it wasn't a question, so I'm just... <laughs> Uh, we've got time for one more, not question, if anyone's got one. <laughs> Anybody? Otherwise we do coffee, that's fine. Otherwise we, we do coffee and you can hopefully not overwhelm Francisco, but uh, talk to her during the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you again. Thank you.